Greetings. Welcome to another broadcast of I Have a Testimony. I'm your brother, Brother Willie Muhammad. God came to us to seek and to save that which was lost. He raised a man from among us. He, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, laid the foundation. What I'm doing is something that comes from him through me and the thing that he uses in me to do the work is my faith in him and the word that he taught to produce men and women who wanted to clean up their life and build an independent nation for the glory of God. Today, brothers and sisters, we are blessed to have with us one of the many jewels here in the southwestern region of the Nation of Islam, often referred to as the South Best region by, by its members. We have with us Brother Derek Muhammad. He's a believer. He's an activist. He's, in far, he's a father, an author, motivational speaker, and the biological brother of our brother, Brother Abdul Kiyan Muhammad, who's also been a guest on this show. Check out our brother Derek speaking to some youth. In this video, choices. You saw the young man on the video with the tats on his face holding the semi automatic weapon, telling you not to be like him. How did he get that way? At some point, he thought that he ran out of options. A lot of men doing time in prison. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Some doing life because they committed a crime. Why? Because they believe that they ran out of options. It's the enemy's job to make you believe that you don't have no options. And on top of that, it's his job to make certain that he minimizes the options as much as possible for black and brown males in this country. It's heavy right there, my brother. So I saw alaikum, dear brother. Alaikum salam, brother Willie. Yes, sir. And thank you for accepting the invitation to be a guest on this show, man. My brother, it's a pleasure, a privilege, and an honor to be here with you. And congratulations on the success of the program, brother. We've been enjoying it from a distance. Praise be to Allah. So I'd like to get straight into the interview. So my first question is this, you know, in preparation for this interview, I read your bio on your website. And I read something that really touched me and it stated where you said, quote, at the age of 11, his father died and his mother struggled with addiction to drugs. Derek was raised in an environment where drugs, gangs, violence, prostitution, police brutality and other social cancers were prominent. And my question to you is, you know, despite those trying circumstances, you, you are here. Your father, as we stated, an activist and many of the things that we mentioned in the opening. So my question is. When you look back at those circumstances, what do you see as the reason why you survived them? Well, the short answer is that I believe that Almighty God, Allah, from my birth, from the time that I was conceived in the womb of my mother, Mavis Muhammad, I believe that God had a plan and a purpose for me. And all of the adversity that myself and my siblings and others faced during our childhood, I now see those as bricks or building blocks that made us or that is still making us into who it is that God desires for us to be so that we will fulfill or can fulfill the purpose that he brought us onto this earth to fulfill. When you look at the clip that you just so graciously showed of myself speaking at the Black Male Summit, I could speak with such conviction to the plight of the young Black male because I myself have been there. So I think, you know, looking back in hindsight, and as they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. I do believe that God makes us to survive certain things in our lives so that when we get to the other side of that trial, we're able to reach back and help others over the fence as well. So in short, I believe that I was able to survive those things because God has a plan. What, what does the brother, the rapper Drake, got the song that says God's plan? Mm -hmm. The good, the bad, the ugly, the fortunate, and the unfortunate, 
if we use it properly, it can all be just a part of God's plan. Yes, sir. And I, I love your response to that because that brings me to this next question that's right in accord with that. And it's just something I've been studying lately, you know, it, like, so, you know, I watched Mary J. Blige's new documentary a few months ago that's online. And of course, it shows how she experienced and overcame a lot, right? But as I watched it, I reflected on what I personally saw concerning her impact on women at her concerts. It's like a religious experience, brother, when they she's performing in her music, right? And it made me ask myself that if we remove all of what Mary J experienced, would we have that same Mary J today, right? And we could do that with many other people. And so my question to you would, would you be the compassionate person you are, the fighter, the lover of our people you are, if you had not experienced those odds that you overcame? So brother Willie, because sometimes we don't realize what is happening to us when we're doing what the church folk call going through, you know? Mm -hmm. When we're going through those tough periods in life, when we're going through those trials in life, those major, you know, make or break you type trials, we don't realize that we're being fashioned for something bigger and something greater. Minister Farrakhan uses the term uh, purification. You know, when you go through the fire, your heart is being purified and it's being purified for greater work. So I believe as our sister Mary J. Blige was going through her trials, God was sprinkling something into her soul that ended up coming across in her music that made women who were just like her to relate to her struggle and to relate to her personality. And I think that is the case for us all. When we're going through those tough trials in life, God is sprinkling something into our soul. And if we can make it through the tough periods, we can use that which is sprinkled in our soul to help to save the souls of those that we have been called to help. We, uh, this is an additional question I want to ask, because what you said, it was just so profound. And I think it's fitting uh, for the time we're in right now. We kind of talked about it briefly. You know, can you give any words of advice and comforting or guidance to those who are watching this broadcast who are feeling that pressure of this time, you know, feeling like this environment that has been created, the pandemic of the unvaccinated, just some guidance, just what it, it, it's not even a vaccine, just the murders and all the stuff that our community is dealing with. It just seems like it's amplified now. You know, Brother Willie, I have to be honest. It's sometimes very tough to give guidance when we're all going through something that we've never been through before. It's not like I can tell you, well, this is how I made it through the last pandemic. We've never gone through this before. And so all I can tell you is what the wise man has told me. And I was listening to Brother Ishmael this morning who spoke from Mas Mariam. And he was talking about the struggle of life and the pressures associated from the struggle of life. And he reminded us that the only way that we could even come to birth is that we had to overcome overwhelming and great odds. So when the sperm was released from our father's person, Millions and billions of sperm were released, but only one made it. And that one that made it is you and I. And if we can overcome that struggle, then we can overcome any struggle because God will not put on us more than we can bear. And he's, he quoted for us three things that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said that in order to justify your existence as a human being, you must overcome three things. He said, number one, you must pull up from gravity. You gotta be able to pull up from gravity. When something is weighing you down, you gotta prove that you can get back up. Number two, you must be able to face overwhelming odds. 
and come out the victor on the other side with God's help. And number three, you must learn how to overcome while in a hostile environment. Now, the environment in which we live right now with the pandemic, the sickness that has taken place, it's unprecedented. Let's be real, brother. You can hardly turn on your phone or your computer without learning of a new transition or a new death, as they call it. So many people are dying. You can't keep up with it. Yesterday, I learned that a friend of mine that I've been knowing for probably 40 years, his funeral was on yesterday. But I didn't even learn of his passing until yesterday because people are dying so fast you can barely keep up with it. When you look at this civil war that's being created between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, there's just pressure all around us. And I don't think that any one of us, no, no matter how strong we are, can in any way, form or fashion escape it. You're going to be touched by it. But again, back to the words of the wise man, we must learn to pull up from gravity. We must, have, we must meet and overcome overwhelming odds. And we must be able to control or overcome in a hostile, in a hostile environment. And I think the best way to do that is to rely on the creator, the one who gave us life in the first place. You know, they say God does not give you a mission and not give you what you need in order to accomplish that mission. And I think he's given us everything that we need to adjust, adapt and overcome during these, these perilous times. But we have to be very, very careful that we are not taken away with the current. And the last thing I'll say is this, we have to double down on what I call our light work, L-I-G-H-T. That's the self work that you do within. You have to double down on prayer because the devil is doubling down on evil. You have to double down on meditation if this is your form of light work. We have to double down on the doing of good deeds and you know that which creates good in the world because the enemy is working overtime. So I think the harder we struggle against the enemy within, the more likely we'll be able to survive and overcome those obstacles that the enemy without has placed in our path. Man, that I was, hope I answered the question. Oh, no, it was, it was beautiful, brother, that Allah allowed you to share that because I think it, it, was, it can be a healing for so many of the believers in our uh, community and even just anybody in this world, man. And that's just the thing that we want to strive for. So we're coming up on our first break for our brothers and sisters who are here make sure you hit the like button and we have more questions that we're going to hear from our brother brother derek muhammad when we return after hearing these brief messages from our sponsors be a part of the force that powers truth in journalism your support helps us to highlight solutions for a brighter tomorrow go to nnvnews.com donate you can get the same uncompromising truth you've come to expect from the Final Call newspaper on all your connected devices. Subscribe to the Final Call Digital Edition today. Go to subscribe.finalcalldigital.com. The hashtag Bank Black social media campaign made strides not only in revolutionizing how we bank, but also how we think. The movement inspired thousands of African Americans across the country to transfer or deposit millions of dollars into Black-owned banks. These are banks that will invest in urban communities, employ African Americans, support Black businesses, and inspire Black home ownership. This is a very proud moment for our culture as we are taking small but significant steps towards building Black power through Black wealth. Please share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. Follow us on social media at NMV News and please subscribe to our YouTube channel at National Network View. 
I am Anissa Muhammad with NNVNews.com. And we're back, brothers and sisters, to continue this interview with our brother, brother Derek Muhammad. You know, one of the things I enjoy hearing is how the stories about how people came to uh, Islam as taught by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. What's yours? Well, brother Willie, I grew up in uh, Northeast Houston and I had an all black experience. I went to a black high school, middle school, elementary school. The district was an independent school district where I was educated called North Forest Independent School District. It's defunct now, but it was an all black experience. And this is very interesting, brother. I did not have a conversation with a white person until I was maybe 17 years old. So when I graduated high school, I followed my older brother into the United States Marine Corps. And it is there where I got my education on how white supremacy works. And it was in the military where I first got my hands on the book, Message to the Black Man. And I started listening to tapes of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Well, when I got out of the military, I was kind of sort of malingering, you know, I had the knowledge of self in my head, but I still kind of had that mindset of, you know, I want to do what I want to do for a little while. And I knew I wanted to be a Muslim, but I just wasn't sure what kind of Muslim that I, I wanted to be. Did I want to be a real Muslim or a half Muslim or a five percenter? I just was not sure. And uh, interesting story, a brother by the name of Brother Jeffrey Muhammad, who is the husband of Sister Malika Muhammad, and I point that out, who's our, our regional, Southwest regional sister captain, I point that out because there are many Jeffrey Muhammad's in our region. Well, I saw this brother selling the Final Call newspaper on the corner of Homestead and Tidwell. And I saw a white police officer harassing him and then handcuffing him and trying to take him to jail. And it just looked to me like that brother wanted to whoop that white police officer. Me, you know, I had my little Afro at that time. I had a diamond earring in my ear and I was driving my little Cherokee Jeep, but there was a fire in my belly. And um, I parked my vehicle in the drive through and left my vehicle running. And I, I walked across the street and the brother looked back at me and I looked back at the brother and I was like, brother, you know, what you want to do? Basically, you know, I'm here to help you if you want to take them out. And um, the brother looked back and he saw that I was putting myself in a dangerous situation. And it seemed, it's almost like that calmed him down. And he looked back and he told me, he said, brother, call the mosque. So I asked him, what's the number? He gave me the number. I walked across the street to the payphone, and I called the mosque and I let them know what was happening with our brother. Um, I was invited out to the mosque by the brother who answered the phone. That's Brother Ruben Muhammad. May Allah be pleased with him. And the next day I went to Mosque 45 and I joined the Nation of Islam. Um, that is, that's the elevator speech. That's the short of my story. <laughs> wow. Yo, that's, man, every, every believer's story and journey is unique but valuable, man. That's, and that's interesting. Because in that story, I still see who you are today. You see what I'm saying? It was bad yes. witness that what the minister says, Islam doesn't change, it's like water. It yes. only nurtures what we are. And that leads me to this next question. You know, you are very active outside of the four walls of the mosque, right? You know, what has allowed you to do so? It's, it's a several, 
try to fit in all one. What has allowed you to do so? And what have you learned? Because some struggle with that, being able to balance that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it can be difficult to balance. And it starts with the fact that it was already in my heart. Mm -hmm. This thing called activism. I never mm -hmm. even heard that term before, mm -hmm. but it was always in my heart. Hence the way I ran across the street to try to help brother Jeffrey in his situation with the police. Wow. Like you said, there's no coincidence that later I will be active in the ministry of justice. It's, it was just always in me. Always. My grandmother was an activist um, as well. So I was raised going to political rallies and things of that nature. So it was always in me. But I have to say that at Muhammad's Mosque number 45, under the, the regional leadership of student minister, Brother mm -hmm. Abdul Halim Muhammad, we've always had a culture in mm -hmm. our mosque that was community uh, re related. You know, a lot of the work was outside of the mosque. And so uh, I was blessed by Allah to come up through the ranks, you know, as a young squad leader, a young, you know, lieutenant, a young assistant minister. You know, we came up through the ranks, but at a certain time, it was time. I was even first officer for many years. And those of you who are members of the Nation of Islam, you understand the significance of those posts. But at a certain time, I felt that it was time for me to take all that I have learned in terms of how to organize and to literally make something out of nothing in the mosque, outside of the mosque, to help to serve our people where I could be of service. And so it was already in me, but I also believe that the culture of our mosque encouraged me. And um, that is, that's my story, dear brother. Beautiful, man. And, it's, and this is leading all to just how Allah's hand in this, because my next question talks about, you know, how, you know, prior to you beginning to work in the community, you, you always put work and in, work in inside the mosque for years as well. Because I remember you and Brother Eric were traveling our region, you know, as guests, as guest ministers, you know. So as a result of the work that you put in um, inside the mosque, because even when you were doing it inside the mosque, you still will but outside the mosque, as you talked about, you know, as a result of that, you helped to create opportunities for it helped to create opportunities for you to meet the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on several occasions. And then you say you had the opportunity to talk to him in 2007. So mm -hmm. can you share with the viewing audience, you know, just what that experience was like and what were some of your takeaways from the time you interacted with the minister and even the time where you had the opportunity to talk with him? Wow, that clip just kind of that warmed my heart. Salute to Brother Abdul Kiyam for sending that clip, man. <laughs> oh, praise be to Allah. Thank you, Brother Kiyam. I've forgotten all about that. Man, you know, the first time I heard the voice of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I knew maybe within three to five minutes that I was born to help this man. Mm. I'd never heard a voice like that. I've never heard anyone speak with such conviction and such courage. And I've never heard anyone speak the truth so boldly. And I felt as if though, this is the man that I've been looking for my entire life. Well, after hearing the voice for so many years, and I'm saying we would listen to the minister from sunup to sundown sometimes you know, back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So when you get an opportunity to meet the man whose voice changed your life, mm -hmm. it is a profound moment. When you get an opportunity to meet the man who not only did his voice change your life, but you studied his life and you have some idea of the sacrifices that he and his family had to make in order for his voice to reach you, then 
it is an unforgettable moment. But the first times I've, I've met the minister, I met the minister as a soldier. I met the minister as a squad leader or a lieutenant, you know, in the back in the 90s when the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan was traveling from city to city a lot. Well, I would be one of the brothers who would be, you know, out front of his door, you know, sitting left over right, holding post from, you know, late at night to early in the morning. Sometimes they would place me inside the room um, where the minister was. So I got an opportunity to, to see him in person and to meet him in person. The clip that you just showed was me presenting him with a proclamation at Texas Southern University when he came there to speak. On another occasion, I remember as a young assistant minister, we got an opportunity to meet the Honorable Louis Farrakhan in his hotel room. And on this particular day, something weighed heavy on my heart, Brother Willie. And I'm a little strange, you know, when we first were given the name Muhammad, everybody was happy. I was happy too, but I felt heavy because I knew that we had to live up to the name that we've been given. And I remember once we had just myself and a lot of other ministers from the region, we had just got an opportunity to shake the Honorable Louis Farrakhan's hand and have some words with him. And I was happy to meet the minister, but I was dissatisfied with myself because I felt that I should be doing more to help the minister to make his job easier. That was just my personal, you know, thoughts. And that's how I feel all the time, brother. I feel that um, no matter how much other people may think that I do, I just feel like I should be doing more to help a man who has sacrificed his entire life to uh, save a rich like me. Uh, we got two minutes and I want to get this question in my brother. You know, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is loved by many and despite having his share of his enemies. And, and if you can say in this two minutes, from your perspective, what do you think makes him such a loved and valuable human being? It is his heart. Mm -hmm. It is his heart. We heard the minister say that the first time that he met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he said the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told him that he reminded him of David. Mm. And when you read the scripture and you read the life of David, you know, David was a warrior, but David kind of had a soft touch too because of the way his heart was fashioned. I never met anybody that loved black people the way the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan kind of loved Black people. And if you've done any significant work with Black people and tried to help Black people, you know that there's no harder people to love sometimes than Black people. We are a beautiful people, but we are a people who have been thrown into the abyss of darkness by 467 years of slavery and 6,000 years of white supremacy. We're in bad shape, brother. But no matter what any of our people do in their foolishness to try and come against our minister, he always finds a way to love them more. So this is the greatest example for how to serve Black people. And the minister says, you know, brother, you, know, you may want to do it your way, but my way wins. And I bear witness, the Farrakhan way wins. So I think that, you know, I always tell people that I believe that the Honorable Louis Farrakhan is the most loved and the most hated man in the world at the same time. He's most hated by his powerful enemies, but he's most loved by God's people. Mm. But, but but we're dealing with a man who has shown us time and time again that he is backed by God. Mm. And it is God's 
Um, it is God's design on his life that has given us life to our line. Beautiful. So we're coming up on our next break, brothers and sisters who are, are watching. We continue to ask you to hit the like button, share your comments in the comments section as some of you all are doing, and we'll be back to hear more of a dynamic testimony from our brother, Brother Derek Muhammad. Be a part of the force that powers truth in journalism. Your support helps to combat false media. Cash App NNV News. AsiaticMinds.com Online education Helping our children to discover their God-given skills, gifts, talents, and passion that will allow them to see their greatness as well as the greatness of our people and upon discovering that greatness infusing them with the desire to use it for the betterment of themselves, their families, our people, and the world. 2022 through 23 enrollment waiting list open now. Visit AsiaticMinds.com. Worldwide, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Download the Final Call Radio app and take us everywhere. everywhere. On your phone, <laughs> on your computer, on your tablet, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can also log on to FinalCall.com and click the Listen Live button. Or FinalCallRadio.com. Final Call, Final, Final Call, Call Radio. Radio. The official voice of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. Thank you for tuning in to NNV News. Please share your thoughts with us in the comments section below. Follow us on social media at NNV News and please subscribe to our YouTube channel, National Network View. This is Clifton Muhammad with NNVNews.com. We're back, brothers and sisters, who continue this interview with our guest, Brother Derek Muhammad. I want to talk about one of your uh, articles that I came across online. And this article is titled Kings Killing Kings, Black America's New KKK. And you state, I quote, it says, however, if the basic tenet of white supremacy is the subjugation and elimination of all nine white people while preserving all things white, I would have to argue that every time you sensibly take the life of a black person, you are acting a fool. You're acting as a tool of white supremacy. While the sheer barbarism of our evil done to one another may not completely rise to the level of the lynch mobs of the old South. If we don't stop the senseless bloodshed in our community before long, we'll be running neck and neck with them. End of quote. And that's a pretty powerful statement, my brother. And why do you think that after all of the numerous leaders that have come to us as a people, national and local, the numerous Stop the Killing tours by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, his numerous lectures and all of the work done by others, we are still exhibiting such a barbaric behavior towards one another, primarily in these urban cities. Well, it is because we're fighting a two front war. We're fighting the war against the impact and the effect of white supremacy, but we're also fighting the war against the impact and the effect of 467 years of self-hatred. You know, I have a quote that says, the worst thing you can do is give birth to a generation of soldiers, yet give them nothing to fight for. A generation of soldiers with nothing to fight for will end up fighting one another. And so during this failed experiment called integration, where all of 
the land of black people, the businesses of black people and the economy of black people got vacuumed up into white folks world, what we did is we mortgaged the future of our youth and they don't have anything to fight for right now. These are soldiers, they're soldiers by nature. They don't have anything to belong to, an army to belong to, which is why you see them walking around with red and blue flags or bandanas in their, their back pockets because by nature they are soldiers. And so in a sense, we have failed them because we gave birth to soldiers, but we did not give them anything to go to war for. So now they're at war with one another. But from the other perspective, you know, I'll give you a scenario. If you put a group of lab rats into one room and you don't feed them for several days, but then you take a block of cheese and you just arbitrarily toss it into the room with all of these hungry rats, oh, they will fight one another to try to survive. And so I believe that the social scientists who created the ghettos, who created the quote unquote projects, who were the architects of the war on drugs, the architects of the prison industrial complex, and the architects of many scientific experiments that are being done on our people to this very day, it is their design. For, for us to continue fighting one another because the day that we wake up to who our real open enemy is and we begin to unite and become soldiers for righteousness, soldiers for truth, soldiers for the advancement of our people, soldiers that protect and respect black women and black children and our elders, Soldiers that patrol their own neighborhoods, not relying on law enforcement to come into our neighborhoods to solve our problems, then it is game over for them. So we have to continue to wake up our brothers and sisters who are killing one another in the streets and let them know you just being used as a crash dummy. If you have a gang over here and a gang over there, See, no matter how many times you retaliate against one another and kill one another, if we could put a scoreboard in between both neighborhoods, the score would still be zero, zero. As long as you are killing your own, you are aiding and abetting white supremacy and you are a tool against your own people. And so we are in an active fight to stop the violence and the killing in our community. But before we can do that, we must first teach our brothers and sisters the love of self. Beautiful. The, the knowledge of self creates love for self. Mm -hmm. And love for self creates respect for self. And respect for self creates respect for life. That is our work, dear brother. And we gotta get busy double time on our work. Yes, sir. And then that same article, you said the following quote, think, think this over. What if a group of Ku Klux Klan members decided to put on their white sheets and showed up 100 deep on the south side of Chicago in gang territory, Houston's third war, South Central LA, or the pork and beans project in Miami? What if the KKK showed up to the hood in Brooklyn, North Philly, Atlanta, St. Louis, Baton Rouge, or any other city where we kill one another disproportionately? I guarantee if a gang of white sheets pulled up in any hood, we will unite, organize, and mobilize like never before to rid our neighborhood of the KKK. All I'm saying is the same energy we will use to come together to fight against the KKK in our own neighborhoods is the same energy we must use to come together and unite to fight against gang kings killing kings. And my question to you is, why do you think we don't see that same energy that you talked about when it comes to us killing us? Because, you know, many of our people, they only go by what it is that they see. And in the nation of Islam, we're taught that we're taught the power of the unseen. 
The truth is, if I were to go out there right now and gun down one of my brothers, yeah, the KKK may not physically be there in white sheets and white hoods, but the KKK mentality is there in me. In me. And so a lot of us don't see what it is that we're doing when we kill our brother because the less you love yourself, the easier it is for you to take out somebody that looks just like you. And again, it goes back to, you know, our people have to be re-educated. Our people have to be organized and reorganized. And they have to be given a productive purpose in life. Every one of these young brothers, if you sit down and speak with them one on one, you will see that they are brilliant and they have the potential to be great, the potential to be history makers if they could just be guided in the right direction. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan says it like this. He says that the black man and woman are righteous by nature, but we are totally unrighteous by circumstance. So when we remove the circumstances, then we give the nature an opportunity to come out. And when we start to, to act in accord with our natural self, the way that God made us, then you will see the numbers in the, the violence in our community decline. You will see the presence of fathers in our children's lives go up. You will see businesses popping up you know, all around our community. We'll be productive in using our time a lot more wisely because we know who we are and whose we are. But as long as ignorance, and ignorance is the number one enemy in our community, not the white man, it's ignorance. Because if we come out of our ignorant state, there's nothing that white people can do to stop our rise. But as long as we're in that ignorant state, you will, we will continue to see um, the results from the state in which we live. And so <clears throat> my next question in these last three minutes before our next break, you know, you're not just a person that's been talking about the killing and that's all. You have for over, I think probably over a decade been hosting Smart Enough Black Male Summits. You know, what have you hoped to achieve while hosting such summits? And do you believe you have achieved what you started out to actually do? Well, as an activist, you know, and anyone who does quote unquote activist work can bear witness, um, the community sees you as their property. And, you know, your phone number circulates. People find a way to get to you. And when they find a way to get to you, they're finding a way to get to you with their problems in hopes that you could help them. And I remember I would have to go to court with young brothers who had gotten into some kind of trouble maybe three, four times a week sometimes. And to be quite honest with you, that will wear you out, brother. It became overwhelming. And, you know, at some point, Allah put it in my heart. You know, we have to find some way to reach our brothers before they have this encounter with law enforcement, before they have this, you know, encounter with the gang leader or, or whomever. And I had to remember what we're taught as FOI, we're taught to teach and train. So there are two types of activism, Brother Willie. You have what I call proactivism and you have what I call reactivism. When, you, when you're participating or moving in the reactivist mode, then you're responding, constantly responding to the bad thing that's already happened. But when you are proactive, then what you're doing is you're equipping young black boys with tools to be able to handle themselves so that they don't end up in court in the first place. And so we started down this road with the Smart Up Black Male Summit in 2010, I think. So it's been about, it's been about 12 or 13 years. And Allah has blessed us to take it to different uh, cities. Have we accomplished what we set out to accomplish? 
I would say to some degree, because you always run into boys who parents took them to the summit from, you know, for many years when they were boys, and then they come back to tell you how the things that they learned has helped them in, in their manhood. But in totality, I cannot say that we've accomplished what we set out to accomplish because our people are still in co the condition that we're in right now. So our work is ongoing. We will always be working to better the condition economically, financially, educationally, if that's a word, politically, socially, morally, and otherwise, we, we must always work to better the condition of the black male in this country because it doesn't matter who's the president, they're not gonna have an agenda that addresses the unique, unique needs of black males. It's just not gonna happen. So it's up to us to make certain that we reinstitutionalize the African proverb of each one teach one. And let me say this, brother, the first time that we ever saw any movement that was geared toward the empowerment of black men was the 1995 Million Man March. Yes, sir. And so the Black Male Summit and all of the other efforts that we strive to spearhead to empower black men specifically have been and are still inspired by the Million Man March. Beautiful, man. This, this time is going by fast. We're on our next break, right? And we will be... Let me see what we, we're, right, brother? Let me see the, uh, I didn't got so caught up in the interview, but I believe we're, we're on our next break and we'll be right back with more of this interview with our brother, brother Derek Muhammad. Peace. Be a part of the force that powers truth in journalism. Your support helps us to highlight solutions for a brighter tomorrow. Go to nnvnews.com slash donate. Individually, we are poor when you compare us with white society in America. We are poor. Collectively, we are richer than all the nations in the world with the exception of nine. That's power right there if we know how to prove. We begin the process of building a great economic base. And at the same time, we are putting pressure where it really hurts. We don't have to argue with anybody. We just need to go around to these stores and to these massive industries in our country. Say, God sent us by here to say to you that you're not treating his children right. We come by here to ask you to make the first item on your agenda bad treatment where God's children are concerned. Now, if you are not prepared to do that, we do have an agenda that we must follow. And our agenda calls for withdrawing economic support from you. We mean business now and we are determined to gain our rightful place in God's world. AsiaticMinds.com Online education, helping our children to discover their God-given skills, gifts, talents, and passion that will allow them to see their greatness, as well as the greatness of our people and upon discovering that greatness, infusing them with the desire to use it for the betterment of themselves, their families, our people, and the world. 2022 through 23 enrollment waiting list open now. Visit AsiaticMinds.com. Please share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. Follow us on social media at NMV News, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel at National Network View. I am Anissa Muhammad with NNVNews.com.
And we're back, brothers and sisters, to conclude this interview with our brother, brother Derek Muhammad. And there's just a few questions I want to ask before we do so. You know, let's take a moment to talk about your brother, brother Abdul Kian Muhammad. What do you think about when you see him providing the very important service he's providing to our nation and to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, you know, with the social media and there's so much other stuff that he has done and is doing? You know, it makes me very proud as his older blood brother, and it makes me very proud as his brother in the class of the Fruit of Islam. Mm -hmm. You know, brother Kiyam and I sort of had like two childhoods, meaning we grew up together in the same household as children, but we also grew up together in the same spiritual household in the nation of Islam. Many of the attributes that I see our brother display in helping our dear minister were attributes that I saw in him as a child. And, 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 and can even say I tried to help protect and cultivate in him when he was a child. But I have to be honest, I, would, I did not see Allah using him in the way that he's using him to help our honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. I couldn't see that far. But um, I think I'm thankful that Allah has allowed me to live long enough to witness my younger brother become what it is that he is becoming um, in the nation of Islam. Beautiful. And as you look over your life, man, you know, what have you come to realize as some of the most profound lessons, you know, that you've come to learn? There are many. There are many. But if I could just point out one, you know, when I first joined the Nation of Islam, I was asleep one night and I had a vision. And um, I was I was walking on like a dirt road and it was as if though we were on a military base. And I remember being in camouflage and I was walking with another brother and I looked over and I saw a gang of black men and he had somebody on their shoulders throwing him up and down, hoisting him up and down, sort of the way you do a coach after you win the Super Bowl, you know? And me being a young Muslim, I looked over there and I asked, man, who is that? And the brother who was walking with me said, oh, that's, that's Master Fahd Muhammad. And for those who don't know, the founder of the nation of Islam, God in person. Master Fahd Muhammad. And um, so from that vision, you know, I look back and in it, I saw that we had gained the victory. But I remember the way that I felt, I felt that we had been at war. And so if I've learned nothing in life is that the victory at the end of the war is worth the pain and anguish that you have to go through in order to get there. And I hope that makes sense. Something that I've learned in the nation of Islam, and this is for the believers, because earlier you talked about, you know, balancing, you know, the work in the mosque versus the work outside of the mosque. We have to remember that whether you're in the mosque or outside of the mosque, you're in the nation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what I learned, Brother Willie, is that we are all on the same mission as believers. The mission is the resurrection of the dead. The mission is to bring the 40 to 50 million to the Lamb of God. We all have the same mission, but we don't all have the same function. And what I would hope for younger believers is to Let's get busy with the mission. But whatever Allah has given you in terms of your attributes or your ideas, don't be afraid to pursue that within the framework of the mission, because that is how we're going to create a future for our nation. So there's a difference between mission and function. We must be about the mission, but at the same time, we must also be sharpening our tools so that we can serve our unique function in our nation 
the great brother Paul Robeson said this. He said that the battle is everywhere. Whoever the young people who are running this particular broadcast behind the scenes, they're serving a specific function that's very important. And I just want to encourage the young believers in the nation of Islam, get after the mission and don't be afraid to go after whatever it is Allah has put on you in terms of your function. And the last thing, uh, was there anything you wanted to share that you did not have a chance to during the interview? Uh, if so, here's your opportunity. I would like to say that we are living in an hour of betrayal. Mm. We're living in a very, very dark period. And I cannot wait to hear the words of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on February 27th on Savior's Day weekend, inshallah. But for those of you out there who are the enemies of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who think you can approach those of us who love and support him, to try to get us to deny him. What kind of respect would you have for a man who would deny his mother? Mm. Would you ask a man to deny his own mother? Well, that is basically in essence what you're doing. When you step to the followers of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and ask us to deny the minister. This man is our spiritual father. And he, he mothered us into life the same way a mother nurses her child after she gives birth to a child. And it sometimes makes me angry to even think that somebody would approach me to ask me to deny, denounce mm. my mother. So I just wanted to, that was on my heart. And uh, I hope and pray that it's taken in the spirit in which it is given. Dear brothers and sisters, believers, let us hold fast to the rope of Allah, because right now it's all we got. Yes, but yes, guess yes. what? It's all we need. I got it. I got it. You, you spoke when you started talking about mother. Your mother is actually watching the show, man. Just any brief words just about how much she means to you. Let me first say assalamu alaikum to my dear mother, Mother Mavis Muhammad. Mm -hmm. um, words cannot express how much she means to me. I mean, it's obvious that if it were not for her, <laughs> there would be no me. But I just want to express my gratitude to mm -hmm. Allah for my mother, who's not only a wonderful mother, but who is now a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, a beautiful MGT herself another gift that Allah gave to me that I was not expecting. Yes. I didn't feel that I deserved when my mother decided, she made her own personal decision to stand up and become a member of the nation of Islam and accept her own and be her, and, and, and become herself. You know, life is good, brother. So I love you, mom. And thank you so much for all the sacrifices that you have made in order for us to be where we are today. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I know our brother, he's he after this, there's another interview that he's going on with um with Core, right? Core the co committee of co Crow. Like Crow. Crow. The coalition for the remembrance of Elijah. Yeah. So that's taking place at what time? At 2 30 p.m. 2 30 p.m. So that'll be, on, time. that'll be online on Crow C R O C R O E. And make sure you all to tune in so you can hear more of our brother's story. Thank you, my man, and may, may Allah continue to bless you and your family as well. Thank you, brother Willie. May Allah continue to bless you and yours as well. Yes, sir. And for those who are watching, we thank you all for tuning in. Um, right now, our Mars 46 page has been shut, is suspended for two weeks by, by YouTube, but you can still go back and watch this replay on NNV News Network on YouTube and on Facebook. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Make sure you continue to tune in. We thank you all for your comments and may Allah continue to bless each and every one of you. This is your brother, Brother Willie Muhammad with NNV News Network View. Peace.
Go home and study. See, many of you don't study your religion. And you think you're going to attain something without study. But if you believe in something, you need to study it so you can become proficient in what you do. Now watch this. God came to us to seek and to save that which was lost. He raised a man from among us. He, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, laid the foundation. What I'm doing is something that comes from him through me and the thing that he uses in me to do the work is my faith in him and the word that he taught to produce men and women who wanted to clean up their life and build an independent nation for the glory of God.